90% of the world actually does not have adequate or access to quality services. That's a huge problem. And again, that's the problem my organization and many others are trying to work to remedy. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski and the host of your program. For those of you who may not know me, I am the mother of a son with a single ventricle heart. He just celebrated his 26th birthday in August 2020, and he is the reason I am the host of this podcast. I'm very excited for today's show to feature a special advocate. Today's show is entitled Children's Heart Link. Healing Hearts Worldwide with Bistra Jalava. She's the Vice President for Global Strategy and Advocacy at Children's Heart Lake, a global organization dedicated to improving access to high quality health care to children around the world. She has over 16 years of global experience in pediatric cardiac care and leads the advocacy and country level growth efforts. In addition to her role with Children's Heart Lake, she is a steering committee member of the International Quality Improvement Collaborative, which aims to improve cardiac care for children in low- and middle-income countries. She is also a founding member of the Global Alliance for Rheumatic and Congenital Hearts, an alliance of patient and family leaders affected by CHD and rheumatic heart disease, and a board member of the One Heart Health an organization developing low-cost medical technologies for detection and treatment of CHD in low-resource areas of the world. Today, she'll talk with us about global disparities in pediatric cardiac services and how they can be overcome. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna Bistra. Thank you so much, and I'm very happy to be here. I am happy to have you here because I had no idea all these different organizations existed. So we're going to be learning a lot today. First, why did you become involved in working with the congenital heart defect community? Well, I wish I had a straightforward answer, like probably most of your listeners do, that they have a personal connection to congenital heart disease or heart disease in general. Luckily, I don't, but it kind of a happenstance. During graduate school, I knew I wanted to work in international development and use my business skills and education for that. And so I looked for jobs in this area and did a number of internships. And I started an internship in 2003 with Children's HeartLink. And so I stayed there for the last, what is now 16, almost 17 years. Wow. And I think that I don't want to do anything else. I really understand the community and feel empathy towards all the parents and people who experience this. And I really have become a strong advocate for improvements in health in general, but especially for this really underserved area or underserved area of healthcare. Wow. So you don't have a child or a parent or a sibling that has a heart defect? I don't. No, I don't. That's amazing. That's amazing to me that you kind of fell into this. (laughs) And found your yes, calling yeah. in doing so. I mean, that's amazing. Well, that's wonderful. I wish there were more people like you out there. You're right. Most of the people who listen to this show and most of the people who I know who become involved in pediatric cardiology do so because of a personal link. Although, of course, a lot of the doctors and nurses I talk to, not so much. They, like you, just started yeah. studying whatever their area of expertise is and then sometimes by circumstance, came into pediatric cardiology. And the interesting thing is that a lot of people who are outside the field of pediatric cardiology, once they get introduced to it, they do fall in love with it. They do find a calling there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I would say that's true for me. And I really love the people I work with. I've met some incredible patients and families. And I think as a mother, this changed my perception on how lucky most of us are. I really love the people I work with. I have made some incredible friendships. I've met incredible colleagues, not only my colleagues at Children's HeartLink, but all the partners at Children's HeartLink works with all the doctors and nurses and the different technicians that are involved in this. And I have met some incredible parents and people living with congenital heart disease. I would just last say that as a parent myself, I realized how lucky most of us are and how we need to do everything possible to make sure that kids have the best chance in life to really fulfill the purpose of being a great human being. 
I love that. <laughs> I just love that. That's <laughs> wonderful. Now, a lot of my listeners don't know anything about what Children's HeartLink is. Can you tell us exactly what they are and maybe what their mission is? Children's HeartLink is this year 51 years old organization, which should tell you how this is a problem that existed many years ago and continues to exist today. We're based in Minneapolis and Minnesota. We were founded by an incredible physician many years ago by bringing kids to the United States, initially from Vietnam during the Vietnam War and then from many other countries for surgery. This really was in 1969, at the beginning of heart surgery. Wow. Yeah. Later on, our organization started doing medical missions, and we did that for a number of years. And since the early 2000s, I would say we've really focused on what we call capacity building, which means that we develop these centers of excellence. So we partner with hospitals that have pediatric cardiac centers already, and we help them become what we call a Children's HeartLink Center of Excellence. That is a teaching and research institutions that commit to mentoring and empowering their peers around the world and also in other low-resource settings. Okay, so let me make sure I understand this, Bistra, because I've had mm -hmm. Dr. William Novick on my program, and mm -hmm. he does a lot of what it sounds like you're doing as well. But he takes his group into the country and they train the people in that country. Is that what HeartLink does? Or do they set up mentors and peers in the United States to work with people in other countries? It is very similar. We know their organization and Dr. Novak very well and we have worked together, but it's very similar. What we do is we really enter into long-term partnership with hospitals. So let's take a hospital in India, for example, and that hospital would be actually paired with what we call a volunteer institution from the United States. And so between those two institutions, we organize training exchanges. Sometimes our volunteers go there. Sometimes our partner hospital staff goes to spend time with our volunteer hospital. And it takes really a long time to improve the quality of the services that they provide. So this means reduce mortality, reduce morbidity, allow them to learn to do more complex surgery. All of this is very important, as you probably are very well aware, that it takes time. And the problem that we really are trying to solve is that many countries around the world do not really have formal training programs for pediatric cardiac specialists. Right, right. Some of the countries don't even have a hospital to take care of those children at all. And so they have to go to a different country, which is financially prohibitive for a lot of families. Yes, that's unfortunately true for many countries, for example, on the African continent. Yeah. There are whole countries without a single pediatric cardiologist, yeah. let alone pediatric cardiac surgeon. And so a lot of people just get on the job training where we work, there are existing programs or there is some sort of training pathway. Okay. But again, that is not sufficient for them to provide high quality care to the largest number possible of children born with congenital heart disease. And so what we try is to really address this problem and by the training partnerships that we form with the volunteer institution and to help them become a children's heart link center of excellence. And we have That's a number wonderful. of criteria that we understand how they reach that stage. Uh -huh. Do you still have children from countries that don't have a center of excellence come to the United States to receive care? Or is your entire mission now revolved around setting up these centers of excellence? Our entire mission is around setting up the centers of excellence. We work in five countries in Brazil. China, Malaysia, Vietnam, and India. And we work with 18 hospitals right now. And recently, we actually started in the last three years advocating with governments for better investments mm. in pediatric cardiac services. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you're really working to help educate at a much higher level the people who work in the hospitals in these countries that serve low-income or middle-income families. Is that right? Yes. And I would say low- and middle-income countries or low-resource environments, basically. A lot of the partners that we work with, actually all of them, have waiting lists. And whether your family is high income or not, your child, depending on the severity of their disease, would be put on a waiting list. And so again, that just shows how little existing capacity is in pretty much everywhere we work. 
Wow. Critical congenital heart disease obviously gets prioritized first. Any child that needs to have surgery within the first days of life would have it if the hospital there is able to provide that surgery. But there's many that sit on a waiting list like atrial septal defect or VSD. Sure. So, yeah, so those that can wait a little bit longer, they wait. I think one of the saddest things for me that I've observed in my experience is mm-hmm. to see a child that had a very easily repairable heart defect and was never diagnosed on time. And now the disease progressed to such extent that they have terrible lung damage or mm-hmm. they have irreversible defects from that heart disease. So do you find that there's a disproportionately high percentage of people in those countries who develop Isomanger syndrome as a result of not having their heart defects repaired? Yes, yes, we do. That's so sad. We do. That is sad. Texas Heart Institute were offering us a mechanical heart, and he said, no, Dad, I've had enough. Give it to someone who's worthy. My father promised me a golden dress to twirl in. He held my hand and asked me where I wanted to go. Whatever strife or conflict that we experienced in our long career together was always healed by humor. Heart to Heart with Michael. Please join us every Thursday at noon Eastern as we talk with people from around the world who have experienced those most difficult moments. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Bistra, before the break, you were telling us how Children's HeartLink is really a global initiative. I'm so impressed with how you are pairing partners really all over the world to help children in these countries that before you all got involved, probably had a really high mortality for children with congenital heart disease. But I also know from your bio that you're involved with the organization called Global Alliance for Rheumatic and Congenital Heart. Can you tell me about the mission and vision for that organization? Yes, Global Alliance for Rheumatic and Congenital Hearts, or Global Arch, as we call it, is an alliance of organizations and actually individuals as well. Anyone can join as a member, and it's free, that speak out for congenital and rheumatic heart patients around the world. It's largely a patient and family-led organization, actually. We were founded in 2017 when we convened the first International Congenital Heart Leadership Summit. As I said earlier, I was the only person there that didn't have a personal connection to either congenital or rheumatic heart disease. It started with a group of visionary leaders, representatives of these organizations from a number of different countries. Mm -hmm. When we came together for the first time in 2017, we brought actually 30 THD and RHD leaders representing 21 countries. And now the organization continues to grow. I believe now we are over... 30 organizations that have joined. These are typically patient and family-led support organizations or advocacy organizations from different countries. We would like to really help develop advocates for congenital and rheumatic heart disease and to help them advocate with their governments or just share more experiences or learnings from their work to improve, again, and prolong the life of every heart child and adult no matter where they're born. Wow, that sounds like a very important initiative and something that even the common person could help you with. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. A parent, a heart warrior who's an adult, they would be able to join your organization and be a voice? Definitely. I would invite anyone who is interested in learning more and learning from different countries to join or if they want to help share experience, you're welcome to join us as well, Anna. Well, I was Um, just writing a note to myself. I need to join (laughs) this initiative. Okay. So I'm going to have you send me a link and we'll put that in the show notes. Is there a cost to join this? 
No, no cost. It's all volunteer run right now. We're trying to fundraise. It's very new, as you can imagine. Right. So no cost. It's no cost membership right now. This sounds like an initiative that everyone everywhere needs to be involved with. It's a way for us to raise awareness and to help people all over the world. My organization is Hearts Unite the Globe and our dream is to be able to provide resources to people all over the world. So I'm going to be talking at my next board meeting about us becoming part of this initiative. I think this is really, wonderful. really wonderful. Were you involved from the very beginning with this, Bistra? I was. Yep. Yep, I was. You are one busy lady. <laughs> Tell me about the International Quality Improvement Collaborative. What's the goal of that? That is an amazing initiative that a Children's HeartLink and I specifically have been involved with it for over 10 years now. It was started by Dr. Kathy Jenkins from Boston Children's Hospital when she brought a number of NGOs like Children's HeartLink, including Dr. Novick's NGO at that time, together to discuss how we can collect better data from the programs, from the centers we work with in low and middle income countries. Dr. Jenkins and her team developed a database where a lot of programs now, I believe we have 61 programs from 30 something countries submit data on congenital heart surgery that is done for children from zero to 18 years old. And the International Quality Improvement Collaborative provides benchmarking reports to every program that participates in this initiative. And benchmarking means that your program is compared to the whole group. And so similar to Level Arch, it's this global initiative specifically serving programs in low and middle income countries to understand what are the common challenges? How mm -hmm. do your results compare to the rest of the group? Mm -hmm. Am I improving? Children's HeartLink and other NGOs like us use this data. We actually make sure that every partner we work with participates in the IQIC and we use this data to help them improve further. And really hospitals that participate in the IQIC have lower mortality rates, lower infection rates. Mm -hmm. In addition to the database, the IQIC has a quality improvement collaborative. And that means that the IQIC organizes regular webinars and we've been doing this for 10 years now, mm -hmm. we've been doing regular webinars on specific topics that lead to improved mortality from congenital heart surgery. Oh my gosh, I just love that. That is amazing and speaks very well to how you don't have to get on an airplane <laughs> and fly somewhere to help somebody, how we can use technology to yeah. provide education worldwide. I'm sure that's a really important part of what is helping these hospitals that are part of the IQIC to reduce their mortality. And I imagine they're probably yeah. also reducing the morbidity that goes along with so many of these congenital heart effects. Yes, yes, definitely. It's a big focus. The three big areas that IQIC focuses on, one is nursing empowerment, then we have perioperative safety, and the last one is infection control and prevention. And obviously, infections are a big, big risk for anyone who's in the hospital, and especially to a vulnerable small child who's just had a heart operation. Oh, absolutely. All of these organizations that you're involved with are aimed at helping disadvantaged children who have heart defects and other congenital problems. Can you tell me about one of your proudest moments in working with one of these organizations? One thing that I always try to do, and I'm a little bit removed in my advocacy work, but I still try to interview patients and families. Mm -hmm. I do that because all of our work is really so clinically focused. It's so easy sometimes to forget about the families and the patients. Mm -hmm. Not that you forget about, but you kind of are so focused on fixing that heart on fixing that problem in front of you. It's serious and everyone takes that very serious. It's a little bit uncomfortable to do those patient interviews and family interviews, but I always try to do them because I always learn something different and something new, something that sometimes the nurse or the doctor are not going to notice. Mm -hmm. I have a list of families that I've interviewed. And it brings me to tears mm -hmm. as a mom sure. to listen to these parents' experiences and mm -hmm. to understand better how they feel. And one thing that I've realized is that it doesn't matter where you are born, doesn't matter who you are and what you do, we all care about children in exactly the same way. Yeah. Every parent around the world wants their child to be healthy, sure. wants their child to 
thrive and to live well. Mm-hmm. And have a good quality of life. Exactly. Yeah. None of us want children so, who are in the hospital constantly due to their heart defects. We want them to be able to go to school, to get a job, to get married someday, yeah. to have children so we can become grandparents. I mean, that is something that all of us dream about. For you to actually do those personal interviews, it gives you a chance to put a face to what it is that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. I heard in a conference once, I believe it's a social worker that was working with families, and she had a quote from a parent who said, when they asked the parents, what do you want for your child? And the parents said, I just want my child to grow up and to become a citizen and be able to pay their taxes. (laughs) I just love that. I love that. It's normality. That's what we want. (laughs) Yes. Hi, my name is Jamie Alcroft, and I just published my new book, The Tin Man Diaries. It's an amazing story of my sudden change of heart as I went through a heart and liver transplant. I can think of no better way to read The Tin Man Diaries than to cuddle up in your favorite Hearts Unite the Globe sweatshirt and your favorite hot beverage, of course, in your Hearts Unite the Globe mug, both of which are available at the Hug Podcast Network online store, or visit heartsunitetheglobe.org. Tonight Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. Bistra, before the break, you were telling us about some of these organizations that you've worked with, and most of my listeners are from the United States, and I don't think they're aware of how bad the situation can be for children around the world. Can you enlighten my listeners about some of the circumstances you've encountered or the organizations that you work with have encountered? Yes, there's numbers that we all know, first of all, that it's the most common birth defect. One in about 100 live-born children will have a heart defect. And that actually amounts to 1.3 million children born every year. Unfortunately, the current data shows us that 90% of the world actually does not have adequate or access to quality services. That's a huge problem. And again, that's the problem my organization and many others are trying to work to remedy. Hold on one second. You said 90% of the world does not have access? Yeah, that was from some study and paper published a number of years ago. That may have improved, but even if it's 80% of the world, it's, it's still, still a huge number. It's still unbelievably high. It's yes. Still, yeah, yeah. Oh, my yeah. gosh. I had no idea it was that high. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so you're organizations are working to help a very underserved population. Correct. Yes. Yeah. We were part of a team of researchers that published a really important paper. It's called The Global Burden of Congenital Heart Disease. The Global Burden of Disease is is an organization aligned, attached to the University of Washington, and they collect data on different diseases from many different sources around the world and present this information to policymakers or publish about it. And so we finally managed to publish a paper about congenital heart disease. Mm -hmm. And it's significant. I mean, it's in the top 10 causes of mortality of infants for children under one year of age. So it's number seven cause. 
of mortality, and that's globally. But what's really actually striking is that in high-income countries, it's number two cause of infant mortality. In middle-income countries, the number four cause of infant mortality. And I'm saying this because we are so used to hearing about problems with infectious diseases, which are a big problem and we should be addressing as a global community. But this is a completely underserved group of people, completely underserved group of individuals. And we're talking about infant mortality, but we're not even talking about the children who are surviving and becoming adults. What happens to them? Do they have the right follow-up care? So it is a problem. Yeah, I think that's very interesting how you said you're working with these hospitals, you're partnering hospitals together to train the physicians. But what does happen as they age? Because what we've discovered here in the United States is we now have 2 million adults with congenital heart disease. For the first time ever, we have more adults than we do babies being born with heart defects. And now those adults are entering stages of life where they're starting to have acquired problems as well. Just the normal problems that you have as you age, but it takes on a different slant when you're talking about somebody who's had open heart surgeries and possibly pacemakers or other devices that have been put in their bodies. And then when they have problems with diabetes or obesity or alcoholism or so many of the problems that we see in an aging population, there's a new twist. And a lot of these people end up needing organ transplants and lots of other medications to help them live a quality life. So what happens to these populations in countries where they don't have a hospital to treat them? Is your initiative also working on training doctors to work with the patients as they get older, the adults with congenital heart disease? Some of the countries where we work, they have started developing those programs. So in Malaysia, for example, we are helping one of our partners, who is a children's heart link center of excellence, develop and further improve their adult congenital heart disease program. But many countries are not there yet, unfortunately. I mean, they're still trying to catch up with untreated pediatric population and to help children as they're born every year. Yeah, right. Now, are you all using pulse oximetry to screen children in the hospitals that you're working with? I know that's another global initiative, right? Yeah. Yeah. We actually work closely with Santa Maria and the Newborn Foundation because they're also based here in Minneapolis. Right. Um, And uh, (laughs) yes, yeah. When they first started going global, actually, we did work a little bit with them in China for their first newborn screening project there. And in India recently, we actually very closely collaborated. To answer your question, most countries do not have universal newborn screening for congenital heart disease. And I know the Newborn Foundation is working towards improving that. I think what she's doing is amazing. Yes, yeah, definitely. We work with her to develop newborn screening program in one of the states in India, in Kerala. And we did that because we have a children's heart link center of excellence there. All of these patients who are identified through the newborn screening can actually right away be referred to that hospital and another hospital that can do these complex neonatal surgeries. So that's, I think, a very important piece of this. But most countries do not do universal newborn screening. Well, this is something that your global arch community can work on is requesting that these countries around the world do it. It's a fairly inexpensive test, and it really has the ability to save lives. We've seen that here in the United States, and I'm sure any of the other countries that are employing that newborn screening have experienced the same thing. The one thing that I always would say is that you have to make sure that this gets implemented in a place where there's a hospital that can actually treat these types of CHD. Sure. Because otherwise, you identify a child and potentially give hope to the family. But then if they're told you have to pay $20,000 to go abroad to get the surgery and they can't do that, there are ethical issues, I think medically ethical issues sometimes with the decisions of how to do this. Because screening is wonderful and it does save lives when it's done in a region where there actually is service that can be provided for that child later, for any disease, not just for that. Sure, sure. There definitely are medical ethics that go along with treating people the entire spectrum. Can you tell us what organizations you're working with that need financial help or need volunteers? You said anyone can join Global Arch. I already took notes for myself. We're going to be adding that in the show notes so people who are interested can join and hopefully will 
bolster the numbers of people who are members of that. But what about the other organizations like the Children's Heart Link? We found that families with CHD are the most likely really to respond to the needs of our work. Certainly find us on social media. We're active on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and follow us and share our posts to help us really get the word out. If you see a post like this, if you like it, if you comment on it, if you share it, then that helps even more people to see it. So yes, definitely look for Children's Heart Lake, it is all over the internet. It seems like the International Quality Improvement Collaborative, that's not something that we could join, but likewise, that might be something that we could help spread the news about. Yes, definitely. I just want to quickly say that I'm involved with another small NGO called One Heart Health that helps develop low-cost technologies for detecting heart disease in children and kind of helping them, again, improve their outcomes. So that's another very interesting organization. And This is helping people worldwide as well? Yeah, a lot of the first in heart surgery happened in Minnesota, the University of Minnesota and Mayo Clinic. So it's no coincidence that we're all Mm -hmm. based here. I think that there's a very strong community. And I just want to remind everyone that heart surgery, as we know it today, started with congenital heart disease. It didn't start with adult acquired heart disease. It started with congenital heart disease. And That's really what propelled the whole field of cardiology and cardiac surgery forward. Well, it has been a delight talking to you, Bistra. You make me feel empowered to be able to help children worldwide with heart defects just by knowing about these different organizations and knowing something as simple as sharing, commenting, and liking the different posts that are going out can help promote your vision and your mission with your organization. So thank you so much for coming on the program today. Thank you. This is a wonderful opportunity. It was great talking to you. And I would be happy to answer more questions if people want to reach out to me. Thank you again. Thank you for all you do, Anna. It is definitely a delight to meet people like you. You're just a truly altruistic person who wants to make the world a little bit better with your efforts. I can see that your efforts are making a big difference in the lives of people all over the world. And it's truly humbling to have somebody of your caliber on my program. You make me want to reach out and do even more, Bistra. Thank you. Thank you. And I get inspired from people like you very much. Oh, well, thank you. That does conclude this episode. If you listen to Heart Heart with Anna on Good Pods, that's a way that you can promote Heart Heart with Anna without even having to say anything, just by listening to our program. So please go ahead, download Good Pods, share it with everybody else. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time.